here, um, feel free to ask uh, questions. I'm going to ask um, yeah, that you either raise your hand or put them in the chat. Um, and then I'll, just as a reminder, um, please keep your mic muted uh, if you're not speaking. OK, so again, welcome to PSEP. Today we're going to go over the four things that are necessary for gas exchange and to talk about how that affects what we do in the pre-hospital setting. So here's the outline of what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the items in the assessment and in communicating to the emergency department staff what you saw. The four things that are necessary for gas exchange. We'll go into detail about why CPAP is so helpful and then we're going to review management of some individual disorders. So the key, the key thing that we're thinking about when we think about treating someone with respiratory distress is how, how is gas exchange happening? And if gas exchange is not happening, what's going wrong? So this is going down to the level of lung and the alveoli. The key process that's happening here is that we're getting oxygen into the blood. We're getting carbon dioxide out of the blood. And any problem with any of those things is going to ultimately cause respiratory distress. It can help us to think through our treatment priorities and to adjust our treatment on the fly if we have a mental model of how that works and how the different treatments we have affect that. So what's necessary for gas exchange? So obviously you need a patent airway. You need to be able to generate negative pressure, um, both from the diaphragm and then from the um, from the accessory muscles of breathing. You need surface area in the lungs that's unimpeded that allows that allows for free gas exchange. And then you need to have oxygen coming into the lungs, and then you need to have the carrying capacity to take that oxygen throughout the body. You need the carrying capacity to get the carbon dioxide back to the lungs and then ultimately out. So everything that goes wrong with breathing is a problem with one of these four things. So when I'm in the emergency department and I'm receiving a patient, the key thing that I want to know is how long the patient has been, how hard the patient is working to breathe, and for how long. Because is increased work of breathing over time leads to respiratory failure. And I, I think, you know, especially when I think about the, you know, the kids we see, all of the decisions we make come down to how hard are they working to breathe. And it's ultimately the same for adults as well. It's a question of how long, how, how hard are they working to breathe, and how long have they been doing it. And so that's where the EMS assessment is so crucial because you're getting you're getting this initial impression. And so both you're getting the history either from the patient or from the family about how long this has been going on. But what happens in that first um, you know, half hour that you're with the patient is really, really instructive for how the rest of the course is going to go. And so anything that, that you can give to describe what the patient was doing in terms of their work of breathing is, is critical to making that mental model. This applies you know, both to a transport crew that's giving handoff to the emergency physician, but this applies to a first response crew that's giving a report to the, to the transport crew. And so, yes, the numbers help, are helpful, but the most helpful things in describing the work of breathing are descriptive things. So for example, you know, they, they had one word dyspnea. They were in the tripod position. They had grunting and retractions. All those things that paint a specific picture of how hard they were working to breathe um, are really critical to having that mental model of, okay, how well is the patient responding to the treatment that we're giving? The, and yes, pulse ox matters and end tidal CO2 matters, but you, you can manage a patient with respiratory distress without having those adjuncts just by working, looking at the work of breathing. The adjuncts are just that, they're adjuncts. 
Okay. So basic principles um, in management of respiratory disorders. Obviously, we want to maintain the airway with protection for the C-spine if trauma is suspected. If you suspect that the patient is hypoxic, um, then those patients should receive oxygen. The as again, the pulse ox is an adjunct and that can help you with that. But there are times when you can't get a pulse ox to read, but you see this blue patient in front of you and then you see them pink up with what you're doing. Um, the, the clinical assessment trumps any any of those numbers that you're getting. And then we'll go into why, but a trial of CPAP is appropriate for dyspnea, uh, pretty much any etiology, as long as there are no contraindications um, such as altered mental status or airway problems. Why is CPAP so helpful? So CPAP addresses all other than the airway. It addresses everything that we need for gas exchange. It provides that pressure to create uh, to create a gradient to get um, oxygen in. It expands the surface area by providing the pressure and um, stenting those airways open. And then obviously we pair it with oxygen, and so it's it's delivering oxygen as well. How helpful is it? So in COPD, for every eight patients that you treat with CPAP, you can prevent one death. And in CHF, for every 13 patients, you can you can prevent uh, one death. And it, um, I, I recognize that I'm dating myself here, but I, you know, starting in in emergency medicine and EMS before we had CPAP in the field, there were so many more patients that got intubated, so many more patients that had longer and harder courses before we had this modality, and we could apply it in the pre-hospital setting. Okay, uh, we'll do a quick review of airway problems. So. With respect to upper airway obstruction, we're uh, with a partial obstruction. The generally the oxygen saturation is uh, so. Generally, the patient is able to phonate. Um, you can you apply uh, supplemental oxygen. You can have the patient uh, cough, uh, try to clear the obstruction, and then uh, and then obviously if uh, if there are partial obstruction, you could. Um, Use time like, and then we move into a complete obstruction. Then the the protocol, as you learned in ACLS, a laryngoscopy in unconscious patients with an attempt to remove with the McGill forceps. And then, if you cannot um, cannot remove the object, cannot ventilate, then uh, that's an appropriate situation for a crike. Remember, for a child, you're going to do needle jet, jet insufflation and go to the closest hospital. I think the the biggest update um, that we have with this, with the new tools that we had since the last time we um, reviewed this, is we we have a lot of we now we have video laryngoscopy that which is likely to make this more successful, but it it is helpful to have a McGill forceps that matches the matches the shape of your laryngoscope as much as possible, um, because then you can follow things down. It's easier to easier to work with and easier to see what's going on. With airway edema, um, croup and epiglottitis, we treat with racemic epinephrine. Uh, with anaphylaxis, um, we treat first with IM epinephrine and then um, then with IV epinephrine drip as needed. Um, with angioedema, uh, there are a small number of patients that have will have a medication at home that can be treated for that. Otherwise, they, uh, with angioedema and burns, the key thing is early airway management. Now we're going to go into some specific respiratory diseases. And first we're going to talk about things uh, that are problems with generating enough uh, negative pressure. So first uh, obstructive lung disease, in other words, you're having trouble getting the airway the getting the air out. So there is more pressure um, making it harder to get to get the carbon dioxide out. Pneumothorax, problems with the nervous system, and then we'll talk about hyperventilation syndrome. So obstructive lung disease includes COPD, which is emphysema and chronic bronchitis, as well as, as, well as asthma. Um, 
Um, asthma is primarily uh, related to a genetic uh, disposition as well as somewhat with allergy exposures. Um, there are a handful of cases of COPD that are related to genetic disposition, but obviously the primary cause um, for COPD is smoking. Um, and then a small number of patients that have COPD is really, uh, because of occupational exposure to toxins. So in COPD, you, here you have these healthy alveoli. In COPD, um, the walls of the alveoli break down. You get these um, bullet, and so the lungs just have a um, harder time relaxing and getting, getting that air out. So in patients, patients with emphysema, those tend to be the, the barrel chested patients um, with prolonged expiration. They tend to be thin. Um, they tend to be um, they tend to be relatively pink because they produce extra red cells. And they I tend to have a lot of accessory muscles because breathing always takes a little bit of extra work for them. In chronic bronchitis, primary problem is that they're um, secreting extra um, extra mucus, um, and so these are patients that typically have they often have a productive cough, and then when we see them and they have these exacerbations, they have an increase in their productive cough. Um, these patients um, are more likely to be overweight patients. Um, they can often have ronchi, and so it can be difficult to tell them um, from patients with pneumonia. Um, and then they um, they can have they can also develop signs of CHF. Uh, and the reason that COPD leads to CHF is that you've got the right side of the heart that's pushing against these stiff lungs over years and years, and ultimately you develop um, diastolic heart failure. And so. If you see anyone who's had COPD for a prolonged period of time, it starts with this. It starts with the COPD. Um, they're on inhalers, on inhalers, and then ultimately they need to be put on diuretics as well um, because they have a component of fluid overload. As compared to patients with systolic CHF, which typically comes from um, coronary artery disease and occasionally from drug use. Um, these patients don't get at, they don't look as like wet and fluid overloaded, um, but you'll still you'll hear the you'll hear their crackles in their lungs. They'll have a little bit of uh, a little bit of pedal edema. So review of treatment. Um, so as best as possible, get them into a, a position of comfort. CPAP is critical for patients with an increased work of breathing, and then if uh, you cannot manage the work of breathing with CPAP, then be prepared to intubate. Um, and uh, and then ideally begin with albuterol and atrovent and solumedrol. Um, following the capnography is very helpful in managing a patient with, uh, with COPD, um, both to get a baseline and to monitor your response to treatment. With respect to asthma, it's a chronic inflammatory disorder. Um, there's um, variable airflow, and so you get these wheezes throughout. You get a hyper hyper responsive sm uh, small airways. There is typically a trigger um, for some, you know, most most common that we see is infection, but it can also be triggered by exercise. It can be triggered by cold um, cold weather. It can be triggered by allergens, and um, and so then you get this uh, bronchoconstriction, bronchial edema. So in asthma, here's a normal bronchial. If the asthmatic bronchial becomes inflamed, and that makes it harder to get the carbon dioxide out. So with uh, with patients with asthma, they get you know there are a small number of times where we see patients, you know, when we arrive on patients on scene that are on the verge of respiratory distress. Um, patients with asthma typically respond pretty quickly to treatment, um, but patients in severe distress um, really need aggressive treatment. Um, occasionally you can get, so you know, anyone with an asthma ex exacerbation is gonna have dyspnea and wheezing. 
They often have cough. There's a handful of patients that have cough variant asthma where they have less wheezing and more more just a cough. Um, the the key thing is, you know, it's always reasonable in someone with a history of asthma to try bronchodilators. The other thing it is in, in someone with really severe, with a really severe asthma exacerbation, you may hear a near silent chest because they're just not exchanging much air. So the treatment goals, you can correct, correct hypoxia if there is any, but remember with asthma, the primary problem is less that they get very hypoxic than just that if they have such significant work of breathing from trying to get the CO2 out. Um, obviously, we maintain the airway and then um, and then provide oxygen as needed. So known asthmatic having a recurrent attack, um, begin with uh, Duoneb. And then ideally we repeat albuterol. However, if all you have is the duoneb, perfectly reasonable to um, repeat that. You just you just don't get much effect from subsequent doses of the atrovent. Uh, because of drug shortages, we've introduced the protocol for leave albuterol or Zopinex. Um, and uh, in the dose of that, it's um, you know half the number of milligrams, but thankfully they packaged it so it's the same uh, it's the same volume. And then uh, our first choice is solumedrol um, as a steroid. Alternative is dexamethasone. For status asthmaticus, um, start epinephrine. Um, this can be incredibly helpful. And for patients that are really in distress, this can really help to, to turn things around. Particularly with young patients, you can be fairly aggressive about titrating up the epinephrine to try to get them turned around. Often that'll give you just enough room to be able to get the bronchodilators in to be able to really turn them around. Um, magnesium sulfate is also uh, very helpful in these patients, whereas the the um, you know the epinephrine you're going to see some effect in a minute or two. Magnesium sulfate more like five to ten minutes before you're going to see the effect, um, but it uh, has proven effect of keeping keeping people out of the hospital, turning them around. Um, you can consider CPAP in an asthmatic. Just remember, there's you're less likely to turn an asthmatic around with, C, uh, with CPAP than you are someone with CHF or COPD. Uh, so reviewing the pediatric protocol. So if the weight's less than 15 kilograms, um, albuterol 2.5 to 5 milligrams, greater than 15 um, kilograms, 5 to 10 milligrams of albuterol with atrovent. Um, with the alternative of uh, duoneb and the leave albuterol, solumedrol, two milligrams per kilogram with a max at the adult dose, dexamethasone, 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram with a max at the adult dose, magnesium, 25 milligrams per kilogram, and then epinephrine, 0 0.1 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And again, with a sick pediatric patient, these are the patients that were uh, respond really well to, to titrating the epinephrine, and um, and there's very little downside in pediatric patients. All right, we're going to move on to talk about spontaneous pneumothorax. So, um, in the absence of trauma, a patient that suddenly develops a pneumothorax. So uh, the risk factors for spontaneous pneumothorax, they tend to be, um, they're slightly more common in males, more common in patients that are tall and thin. Um, and so they typically de describe this sudden onset of an intense chest pain and difficulty breathing. Um, and they have this pain that's typically localized to, to one side. Um, Typically, we'll get some decreased breath sounds on that side, and you will, in a significant spontaneous pneumothorax, you will see some tachypnea that can be diaphoretic and pale. So maintain the airway, support breathing. Um, if this is your leading uh, diagnosis, this is a patient where you're preferentially going to avoid CPAP because you can make things worse with that. Although it's relatively rare for patients with a spontaneous pneumothorax to develop tension, um, always be thinking of the, the worst case scenario and think about um, if they develop hypotension, um, then, um, then that's when you would um, start the chest for a tension pneumothorax. Um, 
Another problem that prevents people from generating the, uh, the appropriate amount of negative pressure is a problem with the central nervous system. Um, so that can be from brain injury, either um, traumatic or um, or a CVA, um, rarely from tumors, and then uh, fairly commonly we'll see CNS dysfunction because of sedating drugs. So obviously think about narcotic drug overdose, think about trauma, um, make a note of what's going on with the breathing pattern, and then um, follow the follow the general management principles that we discussed earlier. Um, well, I, there are also patients that we'll see that can have um, problems of the peripheral nervous system that affect respiratory function. Um, that can be trauma, like a high cervical spine fracture, um, patients with post polio syndrome. Probably the most common thing that we see is myasthenia gravis, um, fairly rare with a handful of rare viral infections. Um, and so these are patients that respond to providing that additional positive pressure if they're not able to generate the negative pressure. With patients with myasthenia gravis in the hospital, we measure their negative inspiratory force. In other words, how much force can they generate? And those are patients that as they're receiving treatment, um, sometimes will require um, intubation until they can develop enough force to, to generate the negative pressure on their own. And then finally, we're going to talk about hyperventilation syndrome. So with hyperventilation syndrome, you'll see you can see rapid breathing, chest pain, numbness, other symptoms. Um, you can see this trousseau sign where you have spasms of the hands and the wrist. You can also see spasms um, in the feet. Um, there are serious medical problems that cause hyperventilation. So yeah, seeing those signs does not mean that there's not something else going on. And hyperventilation is ultimately a diagnosis of an exclusion. It's fairly rare that I'll even give people that diagnosis in the emergency department, and that's typically after we've done a lot of work to exclude other potential causes. What are the other potential causes? So acidosis um, can cause um, hyperventilation. Um, you know, we can occasionally see that with sepsis and patients that have a lactic acidosis. Obviously, we can see it with DKA, um, beta adrenergic agonists like albuterol. Um, and so people who panic because they can't breathe because of some underlying problem like a PE can hyperventilate um, because they feel short of breath and then they have the sense that they need to continue to uh, breathe rapidly. I think the you know the other key things about this um, occasion we'll see it um, at high altitude. Um, you can see it with metabolic disorders, methylxanthine derivatives. Um, that's like um, coffee, energy drinks, uh, things like that. Um, pain can cause hyperventilation, um, underlying lung disease, and then pulmonary embolism can definitely cause. Um, hyperventilation as patients try to uh, try to make up for the oxygen that they're not getting. And then an aspirin overdose, salicylate overdose um, will cause hyperventilation as well. So the, the list is long and um, it really requires excluding all of these things before you could ultimately call it hyperventilation syndrome. So management is to maintain the airway, support breathing, you can provide oxygen as needed for hypoxia. Uh, we do not allow the patient to rebreathe exhaled air um, because the worst case scenario, if there's you know a CNS hyperventilation, the worst case scenario, if they continue to hyperventilate, is they pass out and then um, and then they get a reset of their CO2. You can provide reassurance, um, and but remember that. Not all, you know, be if there's an underlying problem, a patient may not be able to slow their breathing. Any questions about problems related to negative pressure before we move on to surface area? Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about problems related to the surface area of the lungs. We're not getting gas exchange because of a problem getting um, gas across uh, the surface of the alveoli. So most common of those, pneumonia, um, 
in each line see acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome, and then we'll see we see a lot of CHF. So um, pneumonia um, is obviously one of the things that we see most common, and then we've, but we over the last three years have seen so much more viral pneumonia than um, than we ever saw in the past. Um, so this, you know, this is a chest X-ray of a typical bacterial pneumonia where you have this wedge um, that's that's whited out. With a viral pneumonia, you tend to see white, you know, whiteness throughout the lungs. Um, patients can also get pneumonia because of aspiration, particularly if they're swallowing problems. Sorry, uh, just one one more note about pneumonia, where there are the. The patient population that exists now that didn't exist three years ago is relatively small, but there are patients who have survived COVID, but have some, you know, some have an ongoing oxygen requirement uh, because their lungs have never fully healed. Um, and those, yeah, and those, it's just kind of a new category of patient. They, um, they act similarly to other oxygen dependent patients like patients with uh, with COPD, but they're, um, you know, most patients that were old and got that sick died. And so the, the post COVID patients who are still on oxygen tend to be relatively young patients. So acute respiratory distress syndrome is pulmonary edema from inflammation. Um, and so it, with that, they decrease the amount of fluid that they can remove from the lungs, which then impairs the CO2 excretion. Um, many causes um, the most common sepsis and pneumonia, um, but um, this this list, um, in, you know, this list goes throughout them. A couple of the key things that we see, remember that you can see pulmonary edema related both to use of heroin and also after administration of Narcan for an opiate overdose. Um, both of those things can cause pulmonary edema. So occasionally patients that you wake up with Narcan will be hypoxic, will have crackles in the lungs and need supplemental oxygen. And then one of the ones that uh, you may not I think about it. pancreatitis, you know, most commonly from alcohol abuse, um, can cause acute respiratory distress syndrome that develops over time. So acute respiratory dis distress syndrome has very high mortality, um, particularly when sepsis is associated with mul multiple organ failure. Um, and so the symptoms are related to the underlying cause. So management is for the underlying condition, um, provide supplemental oxygen, and uh, you support respiratory effort. Um, there's, uh, you know, we tell medical students, like, how do you tell the difference of a chest x-ray with someone with CHF versus the chest x-ray of someone with ARDS? And the difference is that in the chest x-ray of someone with ARDS, they have an ET tube. Because CHF typically gets better with CPAP, and ARDS is just much harder to treat. Okay, so reminders about CHF. So as much as possible, you want to get the patient upright. Um, remember that you're often seeing these patients in a chair, sitting upright with their legs down. And so even just the act of getting their legs up on the gurney um, can increase fluid return to the heart and can increase their respiratory distress. Um, if you have an um, appropriate blood pressure, nitroglycerin is the first line treatment. Um, obviously use caution if there's any signs of a right-sided MI or a phosphodiesterase inhibitor um, like uh, Viagra or Cialis. Um, any questions about surface area before we go on to oxygen? OK, so oxygen and carrying capacity, the two primary things we see are toxic inhalation and pulmonary embolism. Um, toxic inhalation, um, you know, we're coming into the season now where we're more likely to see this as people are inside more and are running their furnaces. Um, you know, occasion, you know, occasionally if you get chemical irritants or steam, you can get edema, laryngospasm. Um, so, so you get the get the history, determine the nature of the substance, 
and the length of the exposure. Um, treat for the universal care protocol, and treat shock if needed, and um, you can contact uh, Washington Poison Control. If, um, if you have signs of cyanide poisoning, uh, then you treat with sodium thiosulfate, 50 milliliters of the 25% solution. Uh, if you have organophosphates or a nerve agent, prepare for copious secretions, um, administer atropine, and just remember these are large, large amounts of atropine, more than you'd give in a cardiac arrest. Um, and then for self fresco, there's the duo auto injector. So, uh, you also see patients that are exposed to riot control agents. Most common of those um, will be um, will be pepper spray. Um, so to get them into fresh air as uh, as soon as possible, irrigating with water and saline. Um, treat for any respiratory distress. And um, then those patients will typically improve um, Im improve on their own with that with uh, moving them into fresh air and uh, removing the irritant decontaminating. If there's any ongoing respiratory distress, um, they can be transported just with careful attention to decontamination prior to transport. Go ahead. This is we're coming into the season where we are um, likely to see some carbon monoxide inhalation. So it's odorless and colorless. We will occasionally see it um, in suicide attempts. Obviously, it poses hazard to rescue personnel, but um, but typically you're going to be exposed for much less time than the patient is exposed. So carbon monoxide causes problems by binding to the hemoglobin. Uh, it to form carboxyhemoglobin. Um, it binds more strongly than oxygen does, so it creates cellular hypoxia. And so for that reason, um, your pulse oximetry is going to be falsely reassuring. Um, if you have um, uh, the option of monitoring carboxyhemoglobin, um, that's the helpful thing to follow. Obviously getting uh, Getting a reading on what the concentration of CO is at the site is very helpful. So um, remember to consider it with multiple patients and or sick pets at the same location. Um, apply oxygen by 100% uh, non-rebreather mask. Um, if there's no increased worker breathing, you don't need to use CPAP. Just the key thing is supplying a high concentration of oxygen. Um, and um, if the SPCO is between three and 25%, any neurologic symptoms, any question, um, those patients go to um, an ED and uh, with a 12 lead because uh, they can develop cardiac ischemia related to the cellular hypoxia. Okay. Moving on to pulmonary embolism. So this occurs when uh, a pulmonary artery is obstructed. It's most commonly from a thrombus. Um, occasionally, you can see a fat embolism, as especially uh, post-trauma or amniotic fluid post-delivery. Um, uh, we also, patients who inject IV drugs can get pulmonary emboli from the vegetations from the heart get going, getting stuck with the lungs. Um, risk factors for a thrombus or anything that uh, increases your coagulability. So any um, immobilization, surgery, trauma, um, pregnancy and postpartum increases your coagulation. Oral contraceptives um, increase the risk and tobacco use increases the risk as well. So gathering um, the risk factors um, can help alert you to the possibility. Um, and hemoptysis is a, is a warning sign for pulmonary embolism. The, the most common cause of hemoptysis in patients who have um, signs of a respiratory infection is bronchitis. But especially if you have hemoptysis without signs of respiratory infection, that's definitely concerning for pulmonary embolism. 
They typically, if with a significant pulmonary embolism, they will have tachycardia and hypoxia, and then there's often leg leg swelling as the source or a history that oh, you know, my leg was swollen for a few days, and then all of a sudden I develop the shortness of breath. So management is to maintain the airway, to apply um, oxygen as needed, and um, and then to transport. Um, any other questions about surface area problems? OK, I'm, I'm going to do a brief review of capnography and then we'll move on to the take home points and uh, wrap up. So you know, we spend a lot of time um, talking about pulse oximetry and that measures one half of the gas exchange equation with all the attendant problems. But end tidal CO2 um, is a really powerful tool. It's ultimately the, the vital sign that we use to monitor ventilation. So pulse oximetry measures oxygenation, capnography measures the effectiveness of ventilation. Um, it's non-invasive um, and you're following the capnograph. Um, it, it, as long as you are able to read it, it gives you instantaneous, instantaneous information about metabolism. So how much your CO2 you're producing, how you're refusing transporting it, and then how you're ventilating, meaning how how it's getting out. So for example, um, you know, a patient with DKA who um, has rapid breathing, they will typically have a very low um, entitled CO2 because they've been blowing off CO2 for some time. Um, this is a normal uh, a normal capnograph, remember that the value that your monitor gives you is point D here in your end tidal CO2. Okay. And with that, I'm going to move on to the take home points. So the things that I'm really hoping to, to convey in today's session, the key things that we're looking for in report is what was the work of breathing for how long, and then what's changed over your time with the patient. We want you to develop a mental model of what's wrong with the patient and how you can address it. In other words, OK, I think this is probably asthma. I'm going to try bronchodilators and see how they respond. I think that this is CHF. I'm going to try nitrates and CPAP and see how they, and see how they respond. Um, remember that any patient who's had COPD for a prolonged amount of time is also going to have some component of diastolic CHF. And then finally, the hyperventilation is a diagnosis of exclusion. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, I will um, post the link for feedback in the chat, you, or you can scan this QR code. Um, you should have a link with your quiz as well. Um, I really do look at this and I really do uh, value this because we want to make these sessions as productive as possible. Thank you.